Okay. Hey everyone, it's Chloe in Denver and Soleil behind the camera. We're here in Utkiafik. Uh, we kind of have an inclement weather day and so we thought maybe we'd answer a few of y'all's questions and Denver, take it away. Okay, well, um, as Chloe said, we're hanging out in the, the field station today. It's a pretty strong rainy day today, as you can see if you're watching the cams. And so uh, we won't be doing the nest visit, you know, which is what we usually do every three days. So we just wanted to kind of bring you a little bit of an update on what's going on. And the first thing we want to talk about is that the camera may go down. So the predictions for the weather over the next several days are, you know, heavy cloud cover, pretty heavy rain and possibly snow. This morning, the wind chills were the coldest since we've been here. We've been at 22 degrees this morning. And so we just don't try to, you know, go to the nest and disrupt the females during any kind of inclement weather. So be prepared because there is a solar powered system that the batteries may drain and we may lose uh, our, our signal. And if that happens, we just got to hope for a sunny day and charge it back up and we may get a new battery. But anyway, let's get to some of the questions. Yeah, our first question was, are there any buildings or infrastructure nearby? Yeah, some of you have been seeing, you know, people walking a road or uh, cars driving down, trucks driving, driving down the road behind the, the snow owl nest. And there is a gravel road back there a thousand meters or so away, and it leads to a new gravel pit. And so that just came about in the last year or so. Uh, but there's no worries, you know, people usually stick to that road and they walk their dogs down there or their, you know, the workers are driving back and forth. So that's there. And then, you know, you are kind of on the outskirts of the community here. So, you know, the hospital's not too far away and the airport's not too far away. You probably hear the trains going over. So uh, definitely there's uh, buildings and people around and, but it looks like a pretty good site for the owls. Where's the male snowy owl? What's he up to? It sure seems like he's hunting all the time. You gotta wonder if he takes any kind of break. Um, when we go out there and we make observations from the distance or approaching the nest, we do try to find him. We do try to check on him from you know way, way across on some of the back roads. And he's always, he seems like he's always within 500 meters left to right of the nest. He always seems like he's out on an exposed perch, like always hunting. You just gotta wonder whenever he takes a break, I don't know. So uh, yeah, he's always around. He's just difficult to, to find on camera. So this is their territory. What makes up a snowy owl territory? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, that was a good question. Um, Territory size, we really don't know, but when I say um, there's adults on territory, the way we assess it over now 31 years is we know where all the nests have been. So we go back to each area and hopefully we find a nest. If we don't find a nest, then we look for a pair. And very often there's a pair that's occupied you know, a previous breeding site. And then sometimes it's just an individual adult male on territory is what we call it. That's the immediate nest sites. And so we go around and we assess that. All those areas that have been occupied in the past, are they occupied again? And in this year, every one of them are occupied. Uh, it doesn't mean they're gonna breed. And we never see young males on territory. We only see bright white adult males on territory. The speckled males that look like females, we never see on territory. They kind of hang out in bachelor groups. How often are you checking the nest and what data are you recording? All right, so, we set it up years ago after you know some trial and error, and we felt that every three days was a good uh, time frame to check the nest. That way we could keep track of things and we weren't disturbing the birds so much. So uh, some of the first things we do is just to see, uh, count the number of eggs, and then get an idea of hatching and hatching sequence, and how many hatched out, and number one's done, number two's done, number three's done, et cetera. And then we also try to record prey at the nest. And I think you may have seen some video early on of you know a number of lemmings and a number of birds at the nest. So we look at the species composition at the nest, whether it's lemmings, whether it's birds, and we try to age and sex where possible. And so right here, I'm gonna give you a little example of the two species of lemmings which occur in the area. In my left hand, or yeah, is a collared lemming, and my right hand is the brown lemming. And so the collared lemming is not very common up here. This is the one that turns white in the winter time and comes above the snow. The brown lemming drives the system up here and this stays brown throughout the winter time, but also stays subnavian around the snow for the most part. Over the years now, 30 plus years, we've just analyzed a little bit of data 
and over 43,000 prey that we've recorded from pellets, 90% of it is the brown lemming. Okay, and then over 3,000 prey that we found cached at nests, as I just told you about, uh, about 90% of it is also brown lemming. So it's all about the brown lemming up here. Uh, the collared lemming is here, but it's not a huge food source. And then the birds make up less than 10% of the diet. And we do know that when the brown lemmings are abundant, everything on the tundra does very, very well. Our next question was, folks sometimes see other birds fly at the female. What's around? Generally, when you see something kind of over and over flying around the female, almost testing her, it seems like, that tends to be parasitic Jaegers. And they occasionally breed here, but they usually come through and um, when the lemmings aren't breeding, the Jaegers are just kind of coursing the tundra, looking for, you know, shorebirds, shorebird eggs, shorebird chicks, um, even adult shorebirds to capture and kill and eat, and lemmings as well. So if an owl's off the nest or flush off the nest for some reason, that's one of our concerns that a Jaeger might come in and then um, eat the eggs, or, you know, poke holes in the eggs and try to eat the yolk or an embryo while the female's off the nest, which has happened a few times over the years when people have disturbed the nest and kept the female off. A bigger threat, however, um, at least in my mind, are the glaucus skulls. Those are the ones that I'm most concerned about. They're very big, they're very powerful, they're kind of formidable opponents uh, to the snowy owls. And so we're particularly careful if we're in areas where the glaucus skulls are. When we check the nest, we have to make sure the female gets back. And um, to give you an example, when we're working at the nest, very often, the yeah, the owls will attack us or try to drive us off. But if a gull comes in, they'll abandon attacking us and they'll go after the gull, indicating maybe that's a, that, that's a bigger threat. And um, as with they will little foxes and all that stuff. What other shorebird species or songbirds are in the area? And do they benefit from nesting near snowy owls? Yeah, that, that's a good question. There's some data to indicate that a lot of birds will benefit by nesting within the zone that the snowy owls defend. And it's particularly well documented for geese and waterfowl that they may nest close to the snowy owl um, in order to gain protection for potential predators. So let's just say a fox comes to the outskirts, wants to get a goose egg or something, or goose chicks. Uh, the owl has an area that it defends vigorously, particularly against uh, canids, something like a fox. And so the owl will come in and attack the fox and drive off. Therefore, the goose has a better chance of hatching its eggs out or a duck its eggs out. Now, maybe a little bit of the downside of that is once you hatch one out, then there's potential food for the owl as they lead their you know, goslings or ducklings to other areas. And then we don't know about you know, some of the other species as well. Do shorebirds do the same thing? Do lap and longbirds and snow bunties do the same thing? Uh, makes sense, but you know, we just haven't been able to document that as well. What's the nesting area like for snowy owls? Yeah, and as you can see, you know, we're, we're on the tundra, so uh, the owls tend to select the highest mounds, and we've done some analysis of that in the past. The mounds tend to be, you know, three feet or so tall, and because you're on the tundra, you don't get a lot of tall vegetation growth. So there are some willow trees out here, but they're only about that tall, you know, so it's not like the owls can crawl under them and nest on them. So they nest on exposed areas, windswept, but they have a good view of the surrounding country, perhaps, you know, for approaching threats such as researchers, etc. Maybe they get a little relief too when the mosquitoes come by nesting on these high mounds because the wind is always blowing here. Uh, but there's really nowhere for them to hide. That's why they're big and they're powerful and they can be fairly aggressive. Uh, as far as predators, going back to that a little bit, uh, mammalian predators, really the only, the only real threat is, is the Arctic fox. Red foxes are starting to move in the air, but I don't know if they're a threat yet. We don't have, you know, like wolves in the air. We don't have mountain lions, bobcats, coyotes. Uh, polar bears occasionally come through the area, but um, I don't think they're a major threat. I don't think the owls could do anything about it if, if they were there. How big is our study area? How big is our study area? We're frequently asked that, you know. I lose 8 to 10 pounds every summer, and I feed primarily on trail mix, which is what gets me through. Our study area is posted over here on the wall, and uh, it's about 100 square miles, 214 square kilometers, and it takes, you know, 10 days or so to cover the study area. What we do is we, we use our ATVs and we take a series of recognized trails that are snowmobile trails and ATV trails. And we, you know, section off the study area, go out there, get access to some of the areas, and then we hike from there. It's on, in a low breeding year, it's, you know, relatively easy, but it takes a lot of time. But in a high breeding year, year like 30 nests or so, which doesn't happen anymore, 
um, you know, you're hiking 10, 12, 15 miles a day just checking this. Thanks everyone for your questions. We hope we answered them all yeah. um, and we'll see you next time.